Titus chapter 2. I'm going to take a break from studying through the book of Mark uh, for today. And, and we want to talk about some example, examples of godly moms. You know, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting. Some of the things that are under attack in our country, like marriage and family and uh, uh, motherhood, the, the feminist movement is, is just doing untold damage to lots and lots of young women, uh, implanting ideology in them that is, uh, it's, it's just, well, it's, it's sad is what it is because you got these, these ladies and they want to go be professionals or not, but they don't want to, they're, they're not looking to be a mom. They're not looking to be a wife. They're not looking for a family and, and these kind of things. And, uh, you know, it's not good for a man to be alone. It's just, it's just not. Uh, uh, the, the, the attack on marriage is, is devastating to any culture. Because if we go all the way back to the book of Genesis, marriage is God's idea. Men marrying women and having children and having a family is God's idea. And unless you are gifted by God... That's the course of action that you will and should take. It, it's, a, it's a spiritual... I love it. I love my friends that are, you know, every Christian is supposed to have every spiritual gift. The, the Greek word for that is baloney. <laughs> but I've never heard one of them ever say, the evidence of being filled with the Spirit is to be celibate. But 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says that that is a particular gifting by God. Now, if you don't have that gifting by God... Then, then you're probably going to want to get married to someone of the opposite sex, someone who's a believer, and have children. And, and so, so we, we look around our culture and we just see this just, just dismantling of anything that, that's godly or that, that even, even leans in that direction. And it's really sad. But as we look at this morning in the book of Titus, not only the Old Testament teaches this, models this for us, uh, and by the way, there, there's, there's some really incredible examples of terrible marriages in the Bible. Uh, multiple wives for men, playing favorites among children, uh, pawning their wife off as their sister, winding up with her in some king's harem as a result of it. Just great examples of sinful people uh, really making some foolish mistakes. However, it's still God's plan that a man marry a woman, that they leave their father and mother, that they cleave to one, one, one another, and that they become one flesh. And then from that one flesh, as God blesses, to bring children. And it takes a mama to do that. Amen? Amen. And so we're, we're grateful for our mothers. We come to the New Testament, and we've got some very specific instructions for moms and, and it really is fascinating. And that's what I want us to look at real quick this morning. Titus chapter 2. Um, he starts off verse 1. He says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. So this is sound doctrine. Sound doctrine means good teaching. It means uh, if a horse is sound, it means he's not crippled. So, so this is good doctrine means teaching. This is the kind of stuff that you need to teach. This is what should be taught in church should be taught in your time of family worship, should be taught in discipleship for followers of Jesus, okay? And then he talks to the men. He says, the aged men, that's, that's old guys, be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. He moves on then to young men, and, and, and he continues on through the chapter. But what I, what I want us to look at is just these three verses this morning, and, and uh, let's ask for God's help as we do that. Father, we thank you for the word of God, and Lord, we ask you to, to just be our teacher. We pray that the Holy Spirit would help us to encourage us. Uh, God, we live in a culture that that hates your word and is running away from you in the opposite direction. And we don't want to do that. We love your word. We want to run toward you and we want to learn from you, Lord. And we uh, pray for the Spirit's help to do that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first thing I want you to see is elder examples. And as some of the ladies here this morning have reminded us, this is part of, 
the process of the church. This is why the church is so important. This is why it's so important in your family that you live out your Christian walk in your family. I like to say if Christianity does not work in the home, it does not work. What do I mean by that? Well, your nearest neighbor are the people that you live with. You are called to love your neighbor. If you can't get along with your brothers and sisters, a husband and wife, then don't tell me what you're doing for Jesus off out somewhere else. Because it's got to start right there. And one of the places that that we see this is is right there with the church. Look what he says there in verse 3. The aged women, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that's, that's the, the, you old ladies, all right? I'll just say it like that. You old ladies. Now, we're going to sort everybody here in just a minute. You know, when I was, when I was little and we went to church, we, you know, the, the oldest mother, the oldest grandmother, uh, they got a rose and things like that. I decided I wasn't going to do any of that sort of stuff because I get in trouble for asking ladies how old they are, no matter how old they are. So, so let's not do that. But let's just say you old ladies and you know who you are, right? He says, he says the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. So, so this is important that a woman live out her faith, that she live a holy life. And he's going to begin to explain to us what he means by that, that they be in behaviors becometh holiness, not false accusers. Now, ladies, I did not say that, but if we were to look that up in the Greek, what that means is, is to have Satan in your mouth. That's, that's exactly what that says. False, the accuser, that's the word that's used to describe the devil and other places. And, and so you, you, you got to be careful. Remember, Peter got called Satan, right? Whenever he rebuked the Lord and he said, I'm going to the cross, I'm going to die. And he said, get behind me, Satan. He said, you don't, you don't know about the things of God. And so, so this is that example, an example of holiness. It's important that a mom model holiness. Mom, you are one of the very first examples of a Christian that your child is ever going to, to see. You're the first one. They're going to spend the most amount of time with you. And so it's important how you live and especially what you say. What is a false accuser? Well, it's somebody who talks bad about people behind their back. Uh, it's the old party line thing, you know. I used to, anybody, anybody here have a party line or know what a party line is? And before the days of cell phones, uh, telephone signals used to go through a line. And what they would do is, is out into the country, they'd run a line and they'd string all these houses in a line. Well, all of those lines, they were on the same line. So when you picked up the phone to make a phone call, somebody might already be on there. In which case, you were supposed to hang up. (laughs) But old women didn't do that. They picked up very quietly and they sit there and they listened. (gasps) And they got all the juicy gossip that was going on. And then they went down to the potluck and they told all their friends what they heard. And, oh, did you know, oh, so-and-so. And and, I'm not kidding. Every family I know of tells the same story, right? That's exactly what it says don't do. Don't do that. Don't be a gossip. Don't be the kind of person who talks bad about people behind their back. And think about your home. Your home is that place where you are intimate and, and yet at the same time, There's all these little ears, if you're a mom, there's all these little ears listening to everything that you say. And are you falsely accusing your neighbors and talking bad about other people and these kind of things? If that happens in the home, the kids grow up listening to that and learning from that. It's almost more important what you do than what you say. Because you can tell your kid don't gossip, but if you gossip, they're going to listen to every word that you say, and they're going to copy you. And so, so, uh, Kyra, uh, I'm sorry, Katie, Katie is raising some baby ducks at my house. And uh, baby ducks are mimics, and they're supposed to mimic their mother. But since these baby ducks are orphans, they mimic Katie, they're not orphans. They mimic their mother. They mimic, they mimic the kids. They mimic Katie and Josie. Josie really is the duck wrangler and chicken wrangler at our house. But, but those ducks follow them around. And they don't know that they're a duck. They think they're either a dog uh, or a, a little girl, right? Well, that's the way children are. Children grow up in a home. They mimic 
the, the people that spend the time with them. And so they follow their mama around, they follow their daddy around, and they learn in that way. And so he says, look, don't be, don't be false accusers, not given to much wine. I shouldn't even have to go into this, but uh, ladies, <clears throat> don't be a drunk, right? I mean, good grief. The most dangerous drug that we have is alcohol by far. The most date, no fentanyl, it's fentanyl. No, it's not, it's alcohol. Because alcohol is where you start. That's where you get going and it's legal and you can buy it anywhere and you don't even have to get out of your pickup to buy it. And so I just, I wanna challenge you. I know that we can have this big argument after church, but I wanna challenge you, don't ever touch it. Don't ever touch, don't toast a wedding with champagne. Don't do it. Don't take a drink of wine. Don't have it at Christmas. Don't have it there because what you do in moderation, your children will take to excess. And alcohol is probably one of the most dangerous things that our country has. And here's what's crazy. We don't have to have prohibition. All we have to do is just don't mess with it. So what's the line? What's the line? This is the one I always love. We always have this discussion, and somebody's going to get me with this here after a while probably. Not given to much wine. Well, how much? How much? Well, let me ask you a question. If Officer Anderson were to pull you over and you had to breathe into his straw, how much would be too much? That's a good way to think about it. I'm going to say, don't touch it. Y'all get this speech from me every year at some point in time, especially for the children. But listen, what we're talking about here is being an example. If you're going to be an example to the next generation, give them an example that they can follow that you were to say, you know what, this is dangerous, leave it alone. You don't need it. You don't have to have it. It has no nutritional value. It's not good for your heart. Go drink some Welch's. We'll have some here in a minute. It's good for your heart. It's got probiotics in it. I don't know. Maybe it'll help you with something, but, but stay away from the alcohol. It's all about the example. So look what he says. He says, and by the way, uh, I didn't write this. So he says, the aged women, that they be in behaviors becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, right? And so, so listen to all the, the young people here and, and older people talking about mom. Mom taught me this. Mom taught me how to cook. Mom taught me how to clean. Mom taught me how to do this. Some of you, mom was your teacher, is your teacher. Mom taught me how to read, write, and cipher. I'm going to brag on, on Wendy for a minute. It's not right now, but before Kyra graduated, Wendy had a one-room schoolhouse that had someone in kindergarten and a senior in high school on their way to college at the same time. Some of you ladies have done the same thing. That's pretty impressive. National, National Teachers Week was just the other day. And, and I am so, I'm so amazed to watch the moms that are also the teachers that are, that are teaching their kids good things. And it's not just about, and by the way, I need to witness here, math is a good thing. Amen. amen. Right? I didn't get a real hearty amen. <laughs> Diagramming sentences is a good thing. No, y'all don't have to amen that one. That's <laughs> false lies. I'll tell you some other good things. Clean up after yourself. Use your manners. Be polite. Do your part. Be on time. See, these are the things that moms model. They, they teach, they show. So not only are they elder examples in the church, and it's so important. This is one of the reasons why church is so absolutely important, is, is the examples that are here. Multiple generations sometimes of godly women teaching the next generation and just showing the example by the way they live their lives. Number two, we, the, they are teachers of good things. They are edifying educators. We're building up the next generation. And mom, you play such a huge role in this says to teach them to be sober. Now that doesn't mean not drunk, although it does mean that, but it means to be self-controlled. It, it means to, to have the ability not to just shut down. 
We live in a society with so many people who cannot cope. Unless everything is on the smooth and wonderful, if, if anything comes in and then they just freak out and I, can't, I just can't handle it, I can't do it. And they turn to alcohol or they turn to some other form of checking out. Uh, I don't remember what you call the pills, Prozac, Xanax. I just can't do it. I can't do it. So I'm going to pop a blue pill and just check out here. It's so bad. It's so bad that about 75% of the people that you pass on the road are medicated. Why would they do that? Because they can't cope with life. I can't deal with this. I've got too many pressures. I have this, that, and the other. Listen, that's what that word means, ladies. It means to be sober. It means to have the ability to cope. You can't quit. You've got kids that need you desperately. Now, you may need a little break, but what do you do? How, how do you get to that place? Well, listen, there's a little song that, that I learned when I was a kid, and I love it. It's called, Tell It to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You, you need to learn to turn to God in prayer and ask God for the grace to to deal with the situations that are coming, to be sober-minded, to be self-controlled, to be steady as she goes, not this boom, 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 boom. You say, well, that's just the way I am. Maybe. But the Holy Spirit comes to who we are, and He changes us into who God wants us to be. And so when we see something like that, and we say, well, you know, I just don't fit this list. Well, that means that God has some work to do in all of our lives. Amen? Because nobody fits this list without the Spirit's help. He says, not only to be sober, to make this sound mind good decisions, but to love their husbands. Why on earth would a mom have to be told to love her, or a wife have to be told to love her husband? Because a whole bunch of them don't. And we see this attack on marriage. And so, so this, is a, this is, is a command in Scripture. And it's also part of the edifying that the older moms do with the younger women in the church. I hope that you have some older ladies like Wendy and I did in our life. Had she, and she didn't because she didn't have anything to complain about, but had Wendy gone to complain to one of the older ladies about me, she would have been rebuked by some of them. Don't you come tattling to me about him. Her mother would not listen to that. My mom, well, my mom's, in the, you know, she, she would, I'm her baby, so she wouldn't have. I'm just teasing y'all. He's getting a little stale in here. But he's up. No, but, but really and truly, you know, uh, we've, got, we've got this mentality now that, well, I'm out of sorts with my husband, so I go see the girls. And the girl says... Girl, you better lose that zero and go get you a hero. No. That's not good advice. That's not what you do. What do you do? Love your husbands. Love your children. Why would a mother have to be told in Scripture that she needs older women to teach her to love her children? Because a lot of them don't. They don't want them. They see childbirth as disgusting. They see pregnancy as a disease. So does your government all around you that, that views it that way. That's why they want to use insurance money to end pregnancies. Think about the world that we live in. That's why God's Word tells us this. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Timothy. Just back one book. 2 Timothy chapter 3. He tells us there, this, also, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. I grew up, uh, we, my, my dad raised cows, ran lots of cows, raised lots of baby calves. Almost without exception, the natural inclination of a mother, I don't care what it is, I don't care if it's a cow, I don't care if it's a goat, I don't care if it's a sheep, a dog, a horse, I don't care what it is. The natural inclination is for a mother, when that baby is born, the maternal instincts, before the baby is born, the maternal instincts kick in. And 
well, you've heard the expression, a she-bear robbed of her cubs, right? That's not where you want to be. You do not want to be between a mama bear and her cubs because she will kill you, right? You, you, you know, I've got friends and they raise registered cattle. So whenever a calf is born, they run out there immediately. They tattoo it, they ear tag it, they weigh it. And they all walk with a limp because of a mama cow that hooked the snot out of them for messing with her brand spanking new baby calf. And yet every now and then there's one and she wants nothing to do with her calf or a ewe that walks away from her lambs. And if you are a husbandman, if you're a rancher and you see that happen, you know what you do with her? Yeah, you grind her. She goes to town because if she doesn't have that natural mothering ability, there is something wrong with her. And yet look at what the scripture tells us. It tells us that in the latter times that people will abandon natural affection. And you're raising a generation of people, some of which view children as a curse. My Bible says that children are a blessing from the Lord. Can you see the difference? And so the church is to model and to teach. And the older moms are to educate and to edify, to say, love your husband. Listen, when you say I do, it's for life, folks. So love him. Well, he's a knucklehead. Well, of course he is. Love him. Why? Well, he, 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 we got to do. Well, okay, pray for him. Get some other girls to pray for him. But if you got a bunch of older women that are telling you not to love him, then you need a different bunch of older women in your life. You need some older women that are going to say, "Girl, I, I'm sorry, but stop whining, stop complaining, and start praying." That may be hard to hear. But it's absolutely essential to what to just simply just listen to what the Bible says. So what, what are what are these things? Why do they have to be taught? Well, because because naturally, unfortunately, people are going away from them. Look what he says. He goes on in verse five. He says to be discreet. That means it's another word that means to be self-controlled, not just flying off the handle or saying everything you think. Who did he say that? He did. Don't say everything you think. It's usually not a good plan. You need to think before you speak, right? Because uh, God gave you two ears and one mouth. You've heard that before, right? Chaste. That, that means to be pure, to be holy, to be set apart. Part of the, you know, we're hitting on some of the marriage vows here. Till death do us part, forsaking all others. That's what that means. And then he says, keepers at home. And this is the one that, that, that's so hard for our day. Does this mean that you can't work outside the home? No, that's not what this means at all. What this means is, is that the home has a priority. That the home is the place that you guard. That's what that keepers means. It means to guard. It means that that when you marry and you have children, that there's a plan. Somebody's got to care for those children. Listen to me. Somebody has to raise the children. They're not a puppy. They're not a pet. It's not something fun. If you want to treat them like that, go visit your sister and hold her kid for a while. But when somebody brings a child into this world, somebody has to take care of them. And somebody, whoever it is that takes care of them, they're going to mold them. They're going to shape them. They're going to aim them. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to have some kind of an influence in their life. So if you're going to let somebody else raise your kid, you better prayerfully make sure that you know who it is. Wendy and I made some decisions a long time ago, and we've made some hard decisions along the way to say that we are going to do everything that we can to make sure that she and I are the ones who raise our kids. That means there were other things that we could not do. It means there were jobs that we could not take. It means that there were places we couldn't go. There were vacations that we couldn't go on. There was money that we couldn't spend. There were there were, there, there were decisions. You can't have your cake and eat it too. That's the problem with our generation. Well, I want to be a mom and I want to be a career woman. Well, you're going to have to really pray through that, ladies, because it's very, very hard to do both. It can be done, though. It can be done. We've got a lot of situations, and my wife is able to do it, so I'm going to brag on her a little bit more. Not only does she homeschool five kids all at one time, kindergarten through a senior in high school, but she also works part-time to help pay the bills in this incredibly expensive and inflated world that we live in. And I am so grateful for that. And, and yet, but, but you got to think about it. I'll tell you this story real quick. Whenever Katie was, was born, um, 
Yeah. Wendy had a lot of problems, and, and we thought with, I thought I was going to lose them both for a little while. And they wound up on a helicopter being flown to Lubbock. And I was driving over there, and my sister-in-law was there, and she was, Wendy was bleeding really bad, and they were giving her blood transfusions. And, and I'm just praying, please, God, save them both. Please, God, save them both. And I come walking in, and there's this doctor, and she's an intern, <clears throat> which means that she's gone to school, but she don't have no more idea than the man in the moon. She's never been in this situation, and her eyes are about this big around, and she wants to cry because she's scared to death. She knows what the book says. But my wife is in a position where if they don't get her blood, they've given her too many platelets, and so she, her blood's not going to be able to clot. So if they have to do a surgery, she's going to bleed out. And so we're in this terrible, awful situation where I come in and my sister-in-law is telling them, don't do anything till Roddy gets here. Don't do anything till Roddy gets here. So I come walking into the hospital. This doctor eyes with this big around. She says, she says, here's where we are. She says, we need to give her this stuff to make her blood clot. Then if we have to do a surgery, I said, what surgery? She says, she may have to have a hysterectomy. I said, will the baby make it? She says, probably not. The baby is too little at this point in time. If we have to do a hysterectomy, it will be a choice to save your wife's life, not the baby's life. I said, I don't want to make that choice, doc. I said, I want to save them both. She said, well, we're going to give her this, this stuff. I said, okay. When are you going to give her that stuff? Well, the order's been put in. I said, why don't you trot yourself down there and get it? Sorry, that's the way I, I deal with that situation. And uh, then I calmed down, and she's, you know, it's on its way. We're going to do this. This is step one, step two. And I said, Doc, I said, here's the thing. We're Christians. And I said, that's not a fetus. That's my little girl. And I said, I want you to do everything that you've got to save them both. But if you have to make the decision, save Wendy's life, of course. I mean, do what you have to do, but, but we want to save them both, and I want you to do everything you can to save them both. And we had a really, really hard 48 hours, and God was so good, and he answered our prayers, and thank God he brought us through that. And then in comes this doctor once Wendy's over the hump. They, they sent a nurse to us that was a traveling nurse that went all over the world to put her in a room with somebody who is fixing to die. And that's who was tending to Wendy that night. And we prayed all night long, and she was in and out of consciousness and back and forth. And, and, and finally, the next morning, the nurse walks in. She gets me. She says, come out here. She says, she had death in her eyes last night. She looks better this morning. I'm like, well, thanks for not telling me that last night, right? <laughs> so, so the next afternoon, this young doctor comes in. She sits down on the bed, and she starts talking. Well, Wendy's asking her about her life and her family. Well, she's, she's married. She wants to have children. But she's invested all that, listen to me, girls, she's invested all this money and her daddy's invested all this money into being a doctor. And now her great challenge is, is I don't want to walk away from my career, but I want to be a mama. And she cried. She sat there and just cried on the edge of the bed. And I felt for her. I did. And, I, and, and Wendy just encouraged her. And she said, look, she said, you can always put that, that medical career on hold for a little while and be a mama. And once your kids get up there a little bit bigger, then you can go back. Or there's a lot of different ways you can do this. You don't have to be part of the hospital system. You could be some other kind of doctor. You could do these kind of things. And they had this great talk, and we tried to encourage her. But listen to me. These, all of these things, this is a part of what the church is all about, is helping us to talk about these things and to encourage one another in these things. And girls, I'm not telling you you can't work outside the home. Don't hear me say that. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is no matter what, the home comes first. It has to. If it doesn't, you'll forsake the children on the altar of career, and you don't ever want to do that. You don't ever want to do that. And so, so she needs to be a keeper at home. This is one of the things that we teach. He says there, he goes on and he says uh, that they be, uh, uh, verse 5, discreet, chaste, keepers at home, obedient to their own husbands. Oh, man. Guys, this is where all the guys bow up. We're like, yeah, that's right. Well, guys, listen, she's not going to obey a thing you say unless you bow to Jesus. That's just the way it is. You, you, you've got to first be a follower before you can ever be a leader. But ladies, turn with me, if you will, real quickly uh, to Ephesians chapter 5. Because in Ephesians, the Bible uses the same phraseology. It just is translated differently. Ephesians 5 verse 22, it says, Wives, 
Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now get that last part, as unto the Lord. See, when, and, and it goes on in the next verse says, the husband's the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. It goes on to verse 25, says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So the, the bar is set extremely high, unbelievably high. Husband, submit to Christ, love your wife. When you love your wife, your wife is able to respect you. She is able to submit to you. She is able to be obedient to you because she knows that you are being obedient to Jesus. It's really hard for a wife to be obedient to a husband who is a knucklehead and is going in the opposite direction of Jesus. And yet, she has to balance all of that out. So how does she do that? Well, one of the ways she does that is by getting into this word, by praying, and by being encouraged by a whole church full of ladies who are telling her, this is what you should do. I'm not going to tell you to rebel against your husband. I'm not going to tell you to run away from your husband. I'm going to tell you to be obedient, to submit to your husband, to respect your husband, and to pray for the knucklehead. Amen? Amen. Proverbs 31, verse 10. It says, Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. He says there, To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. The last thing I want you to see is, is that examples of godly mothers eliminate enemy opportunities. I don't, it, it doesn't matter whether we're talking to men or to women. When you and I say we're a Christian and live like the world, we give a bad example, not only to the next generation, but to the watching world. How many times have you heard someone say there was a moral failure in a situation and they go ahead and throw in there, yeah, well, they're, they're part of that church down there. He's a deacon at that church. That's... That's old so-and-so's wife. They make a big deal about going to church, and yet, look at what they've done. Look at what they've said. Look at how she acts. Look at how, right? Turn with me real quick, and I want to give you an example of this, of, of causing the enemies to blaspheme. Second Samuel chapter 12. In the story of David and Bathsheba, when David murders, has Uriah put into the battle so that he'll die, takes his wife in an adulterous affair, and she gets pregnant. And God tells David, the child is going to die because of this. You're going to have war because of this. And one of your own sons is going to do this horrible atrocity in the, in the view of everyone. And in 2 Samuel chapter 12, as Nathan is giving David the, the lowdown on what's going to happen, he says there in verse, verse 13, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. How be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. This is exactly the same thing that the Bible tells women, moms, when we say we're a Christian, but we live like the world, we give the enemies an opportunity to blaspheme the name of our God. And so, obviously, we wouldn't want to do that. I just want to encourage you this morning. Ladies, anytime we look at a list like this, and by the way, come back next month and we'll do the same thing to the guys, because our list is much more difficult than this one. Love your wives as Christ. I would much rather God say, be obedient to someone, than to say, love like Christ loved. That, that, one's, that one's, I would never, ever tell a guy that unless this book said it. Because I don't even, I lie awake at night thinking about the implications of what that means. Uh, I don't think I've ever approximated that. I know it's what I'm supposed to do. But anytime you encounter a list like this, the, the inclination is, is to just feel overwhelmed. And I, I don't want that at all. What I want you to know is, is nobody here has got that list right. And oh, by the way, if somebody here says they have, run away from that person as fast as you can. Right? But <clears throat> here's what you do with that. You take that and you say, what's God want from a family? Well, that's it right there. That's what God wants. God wants a church full of people who are broken people who have been healed by the Holy Spirit to come together and encourage one another to do things God's way. 
And that's what I want to encourage you to do as well. Moms, we love you. We appreciate you. We're so grateful for you. And I'm grateful that we have a church where these models are here. These educators are here. These examples are here. And, and where the, the enemy has, has, doesn't have a good opportunity to blaspheme. Because folks here desire. We want to do what God wants for us to do. That's what we all should want. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you and praise you. We thank you for this day. Thank you for the word of God, Lord. Thank you for the examples in our lives. Thank you for my mother, my grandmothers, God, the the incredibly godly women, my sister, my wife, my daughter, all these incredibly godly moms in in my life. I'm so grateful for them. Uh, God, we we need them so desperately. We We need a whole new generation of them, Lord. So we pray from these young ladies that you'd raise these girls up that they would have this as their, their goal, their desire, that this would be what they, they pray for, that they would be virtuous women who want to be what God wants for them to be. Thank you, Lord, for this, this time, and we pray your blessing on our moms in Jesus' name. Amen. Please.